Dying Light 2 launched on February 4th and was met with a very critical response from critics all over the world. Reviews have been a mixture ranging from low 4s to high 9s, and despite that response, the game quickly became part of Steam's 25 most played games of all time by concurrent players with a number of over 270,000. So how did this game achieve what it did from a developer who's basically an independent studio now that self-published their own game? How does this game compare to other open world games on the market? And how will this game compare to some of the biggest titles of all time launching this year? What will this game look like in a year from now? How about five years from now? There are so many different questions to tackle. But before we do begin, I have to say, I love this game. It's so much fun. It is overall a good, solid game that you will have a lot of enjoyment from. But it does have its issues. And after playing for over 150 hours, here are my full honest thoughts about Dying Light 2 Stay Human and how to fix it. This video will be broken down into six different sections. And of course, there's only one place to begin first, the gameplay. One of the first things I said about Dying Light 2 was that if you love the original, you'll love this one. And I stand by that claim. This game capitalizes on everything that worked in the original and ups it for the better. Looking at a strictly gameplay perspective, the parkour has never felt better. The paraglider and grappling hook feel like something that is earned and serves a purpose in this world. They are honestly the best additions to have in a game like this. The grappling hook is also much more realistic to an extent, of course, it's still very video gamey. I think the best way to put it is that you feel like Spider-Man when you use the grappling hook. How is Dying Light 2 better at web slinging than actual Spider-Man in Marvel Avengers? This dude is literally swinging by connecting to Uncle Ben. Dying Light 2 gives you the tools and doesn't constrain you. You are free to go about, do what you like, however you like, most of the time. There are times where you are forced to stay in certain areas, and if you progress anywhere out of that area, the game punishes you by killing you. Which at the time of this video being recorded, this is where the death loop bug starts to shine. Over and over, you are punished for veering off the path. Which, in a game that is so driven by player choice, decisions, it's an odd choice for sure to include, and I'm not a fan of that. I understand why it's in for some situations. I'm personally in favor of having it removed completely. It goes against everything that the game stands for. Aside from that though, doing parkour and comboing it with combat is a breath of fresh air. The combat overall is much better than the original, however, it still has a slightly off feeling to it. It's not as polished as it should be. And anybody that plays Tekken games, such as the original Dying Light or the Dead Island series, knows that there's like this janky feel to Tekken games. It's the Tekken charm to say the least, where games will sometimes be buggy and you react with hilarious and funny moments. That's just a part of Tekken. The jank is what made Dead Island so successful, in my opinion. And that jank is still very much here, especially in co-op, which we will discuss later on. But at times, doing combat and puzzles in Dying Light 2 does feel like you're fighting with the game at moments. Enemies won't die sometimes, puzzles will glitch out and halt progression, characters will up and disappear, characters will stop saying their lines, music will stop playing, audio will just cease to exist completely. Uh, come on. It's a mixture of so much jank that will be very frustrating to you and it will turn off a lot of players. Especially when it comes to bugs that are game breaking or make it so that you can't proceed at all in the story, that is seriously hurting the game right now. Because at this moment in time, this is the game's most pivotal moment. It is one of the biggest launches in gaming this year so far. You have Horizon, Elden Ring, God of War all coming out this year, some even within weeks of Dying Light 2 releasing. And when players experience these bugs and glitches, they simply won't come back. They will be turned off and wait for the next title that doesn't have these issues, which is severely hurting the community at this moment. Launching this game at this state at this time frame was honestly probably not the best idea. This game could have easily taken another four to six months in the oven to fully bake a release in April or June. Have it be much more polished at a time where competition isn't as high might have been a better call but we will never know. I will say Techland is committed to fixing all the bugs, and yes, they have a great track record with support for the original Dying Light, so I do trust them. The community does trust them. I am just saying, if this was any other company, it wouldn't fly. Could you imagine if this occurred in an Assassin's Creed title from Ubisoft? 
people would not be happy. Which is upsetting because you have this amazing open world that many people are turning away from because they have no choice. You can't expect them to make a new save to keep playing. That, that's not a fair solution. One of the common bugs that I'm running into and also some of my fellow content creators is simply Easter eggs just won't spawn in. Content that the developers made that put their time and effort to connect further with the community many can't experience. The Super Mario boots don't spawn in for me. The Kyle Crane Easter eggs don't spawn in for me. It's something that needs fixing as soon as possible. There's content being locked to you, but for the wrong reasons. Activities in the open world are being restricted. And this kind of segues me into the open world discussion. First off, the open world, easily the best playground to do parkour. The buildings, the skyscrapers are well done. The verticality is truly breathtaking, and it adds a lot of variety to the open world genre. Being able to swing from building to building, run through an interior to grab an infected and body slam them down is so satisfying. It's fun. It's enjoyable. Games nowadays sometimes take themselves too seriously and you lose out on that fun factor. Dying Light 2 is filled with remarkable experiences and it's enjoyable. The story has some of the best set pieces that are just wild and crazy and kind of what you'd expect from a Dying Light game. But however, the open world does come with its issues. It is lacking in some areas. Yes, there are activities and things to do, but sometimes you go and you see the same character interactions over and over. I can't tell you how many times I saw someone get stung by a bee, or how many funerals they had for Gerard, or the same player models just reappearing at various points throughout the story. This guy, the guy who gets bonked in the trailer, just reappears so often it really breaks immersion when you see Gerard get stung by a bee, die, only to reappear in a cutscene in Central Loop. I think more random interactions need to be in this game. That's what makes your open world game more alive. Also add in more NPC models. I don't need to see the same guy everywhere I go, every corner I turn in the fisheye, he's there. And in addition to that, the renegades are kind of disappointing. I was hoping for more threats and variety instead of just disposable NPCs that you abuse. Like I said, it makes for funny moments, but it sticks out like a sore thumb. Especially when the Renegades, they all sound the same, they all look the same. Like a majority of the time, it's a very basic player model that looks like it was copied and pasted. They are very bland characters, not a lot of them have personality. Your enemy characters boil down to Fire Guy, Bow and Arrow Dude, Normal Renegade with one-handed weapon, and Tanky Renegade with two-handed weapons. The variety doesn't really go any further than that. Adding in more variety to the enemies would benefit the game immensely. I wish this common enemy faction got the same treatment as the infected. The infected have a wide variety with lots of new additions, but also questionable choices too. I'd say in this current state, the infected are like 90% perfect. I would make two changes, but aside from those two, how they currently are, how they act in the world and maneuver, I love it. The two changes regard banshees and volatiles. Banshees barely spawn in, despite in the preview event that we played in November, they were everywhere at nighttime. I don't know the creative decision behind this, but Banshees made the nighttime more chaotic. I'd say add in a higher spawn rate for them. As for my other change with the Volatiles, they're in the game, yes, but I don't think I'm a fan of them only coming out in certain situations. They come out in chase level threes, they're also in dark zones, and certain mission areas. I think having the Volatiles roam the rooftops during the nighttime would be a great addition. Let them freely roam around and not be locked behind a chase. Make the player choose to go onto the streets or onto the rooftops. That would make for some interesting experiences that will add to the intensity. Do I want to stay on the streets and get a chase going or head to the rooftops where the volatiles are? That's an interesting dynamic. And while we overall have a much more intriguing nighttime experience compared to the original, there is a lot more under the surface that could be scratched here for an even better one in the sequel. You can even go one step further and rework the night system completely if you wanted to. Aussie brought up this idea to me, but imagine this, chase level one, virals, chase level two, banshees and virals, chase level three, Volatiles, Banshees, and Virals, and then when you get to 4, you have the same thing, but now you introduce Revenants into the mix. They seem like a missed opportunity to only include into Anomalies. Have the Banshees roam the rooftops, they have the agility and abilities to do that. They can leap and fly and pounce on you. They are barely in the game, you see them in the beginning of the prologue, and then they're barely in it. 
And then as you're doing nighttime, it sometimes feel like you're fighting with the game in order to keep your chase level going. Make it chaotic, show the differences, show the true differences between nighttime and daytime. You can even make these changes for a Night Runner difficulty when it does come out. Nighttime absolutely needs reworking. The goal of nighttime was to make you feel helpless and desperate for help. By introducing some of these changes, you can really showcase that. In this current state, it feels like nighttime is just a harder daytime. You want to go away from that. You want them to be two completely separate experiences. And these are just some ideas that me and my fellow content creator friends have, but I'm sure there are others. But regardless of what it is, I do think the Volatiles and also the Banshees need a bigger role. And from here, we're now going to shift topics to the co-op. So co-op has been a wild, interesting experience. It's been buggy, not working, it's crashing, Platforms couldn't play for the longest time. At the time of this commentary being recorded, consoles still can't play it reliably. And we are about one week after launch when I'm recording this. But when it does work, it works beautifully. The choice and consequence dynamic does make for hilarious arguments. It's combined with the Teclan jank that we talked about earlier. And when you're playing with friends, you can't help but laugh about it. Oh, oh <laughs> I'm sorry. Did we interrupt something? What? <laughs> it creates memorable and funny moments. Co-op does take the seriousness away from the game that it's trying to establish, so do be wary of that. But then there's also the other side of co-op. When it doesn't work, it's a train wreck. The stuttering and connection issues just make it unbearable. Combine that with certain game breaking bugs. It's not an experience to have. I say it's definitely worth waiting till it's fully fixed to play on your console. If you're on PC right now, it's working as intended, so go for it. But the first few days were rough with this. But when it is working, you can experience the story together. And oh man, <laughs> the story. <laughs> let's let's dive into that one now. So let's just start out by saying the story thousand miles better than the original. There's no disputing that. Do your choices ultimately matter? Eh, it's hard to say the way that I have explained it. It's think of it like a web. You branch off and do completely different missions and quests, but you ultimately end up at your goal. For example, getting to the central loop. If you side with the PKs, you will go through a very different path until one specific point. Your paths will cross depending on your choices, but there will be fully fleshed out missions and details that you will miss if you don't play those specific missions. Characters can be completely erased from one playthrough and be vital roles in another. I will confidently say that you can play this game at least two times and have very unique experiences. You will ultimately end up at the same place, but how you get there is very different. And speaking of characters, Hakon, Lawan, they're great. They are strong supporting characters. Frank, Juan, Matt are all interesting enough to keep you engaged. Rosario Dawson really does sell Lawan. It's not like she's thrown in there as like the celebrity guest star. She does contribute to the story and you do see that as you play. I'm not really a big fan of Matt. The voice actor kind of seems dry for it, which is an ongoing issue that does occur in this game. Some side characters are a hit or miss because to be honest, it depends on the voice actor and if they quote unquote sold it. But then of course we have Aiden who is by far a much more emotional, empathetic and relatable character than Crane, Dying Light protagonist. They have this cocky charm to them and I think the performance here is very well done. Jonah, if you're watching, you sold it, you did a good job. I love the quips, they really add to the depth of the open world and it makes it feel more alive. You're embodied into this character, you care about his emotions, you understand why he's doing what he's doing, you understand why he's double crossing people, you understand his relationship struggles, you can feel his sense of joy and happiness that he has. In a world that is so grim, the performance really helps connect you, the player, into Villador. How the player would react is portrayed beautifully here. Crane, on the other hand, as much as we loved our hero, he was a bland military guy. And here, I think Aiden has a little bit more depth to it. But the story, I'd say it's pretty solid. Maybe like 80% of it is decently written and well paced. In the last 20%, it's just chaotic. It's all over the place. The, the buildup is great, but it fails to stick the landing. The last 20% of the game, it's just bad. It's, it's better than the original, but to put it simply, it's a mess. 
they had way too many plot points to try to settle. But before I proceed, very minor spoiler warnings here, you can skip to the next section where I do talk about how to fix the game, but I will be discussing cut content in here as well. So 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Alright, time is up, let's go. When you get to the epilogue, it's all over the place. I went in with the intention that there was more story and that we were maybe 70% through. What? Seriously? That's it? But no, the E3 mission is the final mission of the game. It really makes you wonder how much content got cut in this game. That E3 mission is part of the epilogue, and instead of what it was, you're kind of met with Aiden just like teleporting around the map in order to tie up the loose ends. There are cutscenes where it's literally just skipping time to get you from point A to point B. It's funny, once Aiden steps into the passenger seat, that's literally how you are as the player. The game takes control, it determines where you go, how quickly you get there, and you can't say anything about it. Like I said, a game that is so focused on player choice and decisions, they really botched this whole section. Kiwi put it best, but it's like Game of Thrones Season 8. They're just trying to wrap up everything in such a short time. I'd say the epilogue took me about 90 minutes to complete, but it could have easily been another 4-5 to five hours of content. If they took their time, slowed down the pacing a bit, the landing would have been a lot more satisfying. But when you do this mission, when you do the E3 part, and if you're someone who watched the demo in 2019 and paid attention to the game for months, you will be very confused. The E3 demo made it look like this was a mission that was halfway through the game. They said that by unlocking the sunken city, you will gain access to new quests and new zombies. The Drowner still in the game, but the new quests? That's gone. You get one additional mission with the Colonel, who by the way, is a completely failed character. They hype him up throughout the entire story for this guy to only be in the game for under an hour. It's very rushed. It's clear to me that they didn't know what to do with his character. It's clear to me that there's cut content. I can't wrap my head around them showing the final mission as your E3 mission. There's no way any company in their right mind would do that. Especially with how strict Tekwen was with the creators at the preview events regarding spoilers and story, that E3 mission was repurposed completely. And that mission back in 2019 led to this expectation in so many people's minds that this game was not able to deliver on. The whole expectation that choices and consequences could lead you to finding new areas, it felt like they kept that section in the game just so that statement is technically true and there's really no way of going about fixing this. I would say they could add in additional content to make up for the poor pacing, but, but sadly, it is what it is. If they went back and added missions so that you aren't essentially teleporting around the map, I would say it would work. If they made additional content where you go back to the sunken city, that would be different, but in a story sense, depending on your ending, it's not gonna make sense. I think we will have to deal with how that is for now. Realistically speaking, I don't think any retconning would occur. I don't see any additional content to fix up the last half of the game would be added in here. But to go ahead and really tie all of this together, here's how I would fix Dying Light 2. Let's recap. We touched very briefly on almost all of my points, starting from the beginning. Aside from fixing bugs and crashes, those are a given. Here's what I would do. Add in more random interactions. The same interactions, they get old very quickly, and it feels rushed with what they have in the game. It doesn't need to go to the Red Dead Redemption 2 levels, but add in like a handful more. On top of that, add in more NPC models. It's very immersion breaking to see the same character reappear so often when they just died 10 minutes ago. Add in more variety to the enemies. The Renegades at this current state, they're a joke. They're just a laughing stock at this point. They are more disposable than Rise's men. Let them do new things, be more creative with them. We could go one step further and say, add in more factions, which by the way, that's also cut content. There's no wildcard factions in this game to be seen at all. Supposedly there is one wildcard faction that I've been told about. I have yet to find it though. When it comes to the infected, add in a higher spawn rate for the Banshees. Let them be more present during the nighttime. It makes for more chaotic fun. And lastly, have the volatiles roam the rooftops during the nighttime. That would make for much more interesting experiences. If you want to tie that behind a certain difficulty, do that. Go for that. But that essentially wraps up everything that I went over in this video. I think they are essential changes that need to occur as soon as possible. There are also other things that I have on my mind that I strongly recommend be added in quickly. 
I didn't dive much into them, but here they are. A new game plus, a walking button, a night runner mode, a no HUD option, and transmog. Those are all the features that should have launched with Dying Light 2 on day one. We were even promised a night runner mode, but that didn't happen. It's in the game files. And then there's also the HUD, which is not fully customizable as what was presented to us in those Dying to Know episodes. New Game Plus is essential in a game like this. Yes, it's promised that it's going to come later down the road, but it should come quickly rather than later. Like I said in the beginning, this is the game's most pivotal moment. What you do now or don't do now is how players are going to remember it for the future. All of these ideas should be in the game before endgame content is even on their minds. Endgame content is a whole nother discussion for another time as there's barely any in here. And like I've said, I may have spent a lot of time quote unquote hating this game, but to be honest, I love it. I want this game to succeed. I wouldn't put 150 hours in a game that I truly despise. It's enjoyable. It's a blast. It needs a little bit more fine tuning, which is why I limited my changes to vital improvements and features that should come out as soon as possible. I'm not going to go and sit here and tell you that we need extra skill trees that need to come out or raids or guns or cross gen or cross play. That's all for post launch content. That content can come later down the road. My changes were recommendations that should have been in the game on day one. And the focus of this video was to talk about the things that this game didn't have raids and all that cool shit is a it's a talk for another time because to be honest i want to fucking raid too let me raid that pk citadel up there but yeah that's everything that i have for you guys that that's my full thoughts that's everything that i have to say about dying late to stay human at this current moment in time do you agree with me do you don't agree with me do you hate me now do you still love me let me know i'd be happy to read it but with all that said, thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you Swift, Soaring Warhog, and Decent for being my true Patreons and Ultimate Champions. You guys are absolutely awesome. Additionally, thank you to everyone that's watching these videos. The channel has done absolutely insane over the past couple of months. We've gained over 20,000 subs since November of 2021. I can't wrap my head around it. It's an unreal feeling, and this is only the beginning. The game has just come out, and we still have many months and years to keep talking about it and to keep playing. But with all that said, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.